It's a beautiful morning to be here with God's people, looking to God's word, knowing that Jesus said you should know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let me invite you to take your Bibles this morning and open to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to continue our study in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been in this for some time, trying to uh, go through it in a chronological manner. And we've been in the Sermon on the Mount for some time. Uh, one of the most famous sermons that people are at least familiar with. And we're in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, but one of the key verses in understanding the purpose of the sermon is found in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. It says, For I say to you, unless that your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. Communicating to you and to me and to all those that are listening that human righteousness does not qualify one for the kingdom of God. That was a springboard for Jesus to now tell the folks that were listening to him that they're in trouble. They haven't met God's standard. He's going to use illustrations there. In fact, at the end of chapter 5, his concluding statement in verse 48 is, Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, we're all in trouble because none of us have made the grade. And thankfully, there is the grace of God. And there's God's provision of righteousness freely given to those that are willing to accept it by faith in Christ. Throughout chapter 5, Christ Jesus gave six illustrations to show how mankind has failed to make the grain, to make it painfully obvious that mankind has missed the mark. And so the purpose of the sermon was to instruct those who believed on Christ as Messiah in the righteous principles that they could apply by faith and also to condemn those who had not yet done so, so they would see their need of a Savior. Jesus is communicating God's righteous standard and demonstrating that no one has met that standard. Now in chapter 6 there's a bit of a shift from as he addressed the teaching of the Pharisees in chapter 5 to the practices of the Pharisees and the religious elite and how they were hypocritical. So in from the teaching to the practices and then he zeroed in how that shows up in prayer beginning in verse 5 of chapter 6. Prayer has always been something that has been part of God's relationship with mankind and his children. It's a form of speaking and communing with the God of the universe who not only is the creator of all but happens to be the heavenly father of those who are saved or his children. And so he's going to talk throughout the sermon he's giving information to those who have trusted Christ as their savior on principles that can be applied by faith in anticipation of him setting up the kingdom which we know dispensationally was postponed and will be set up at a later date, when Christ comes back at the end of the tribulation. Now, what precipitated the first 18 verses of chapter 6 is a principle given in chapter 6 and verse 1. He says, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds, better translation, righteous acts, before men to be seen by them, otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. And so the issue he's making here is why you're doing what you're doing. What is your motivation behind it. He's warning those that are saved against doing our acts of righteousness with a, a motive, and, and that certainly includes prayer. In verse 5, Jesus said, when you pray, he's assuming that his children pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Sure, they say to you, they have their reward, but you... When you pray, go to your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and for your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. The men Christ referred to were praying for the wrong reasons. They were really not interested in communing with God. They weren't interested in worshiping him. They were after the approval of men, and Jesus said, well, you've got the approval of men. That's all you're going to get, a very shallow reward. These hypocrites, as Christ called them, were into pious displays, but their, arch, their hearts were actually far from God. They missed on the true purpose of prayer, which is to worship God and commune with him, to seek his face and to honor him. 
You know, prayer is never about impressing people. That's why you're praying mercy. Give it up and do something else. It's communion. It's verbally and internally praising the one who loved you and gave himself for you. It's acknowledging who he is and your need of him. And there is a right way to pray. You can pray correctly and righteously if you're indeed saved by the grace of God here this morning. In order for you to pray in a way that honors the Lord, you need to be positionally righteous before him so that now the Spirit of God can take the Word of God and impress you with him so you can enjoy that relationship in a very righteous and God-honoring way. In verses 7 and 8, Jesus said, And when you pray, again, he's assuming you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. They think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. Your Father knows the things you have need of before him, before you ask him. You know, every child of God can go to his heavenly Father with a confidence that God knows exactly what you need. And that's in contrast to the unsaved, the Gentiles, the heathen who repeated over and over again prayers hoping that they would at least annoy their God or something to get their attention. And even criticizes the Pharisees later in Matthew chapter 23 that they had these long prayers that they would give. And God says long prayers isn't the issue. It's not the eloquence. It's not the repetition of your prayers. It's a heart response to him in faith. And so he's now we're going to say, and again, we've got to keep in mind his audience here, He's going to say, this is how you should pray. This is the manner in which you should pray, beginning in verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A lot of you, if you're like me, can say that without reading it. Um, depending on the religious system that you were brought up in. Now, a lot of people call this the Lord's Prayer, but the Bible never calls it that. Um, Nor is it called an Our Father. This is how this prayer was referred to in a religious system that I grew up in, that I was trained in. In fact, if you sin really bad, you go to presence, you go to... Confession, you confess your sins to a priest, and if it was a real doozy, you'd have to say several Our Fathers and not merely Hail Marys, and none of that's biblical at all. You know, this is not the Lord's Prayer because this is a prayer he never prayed himself. He's teaching his disciples on how to pray in the right manner. Again, Jesus was saying, This is the theme going from chapter 5 through verse 15. When you pray, when you pray. And unfortunately, there's those who believe that this prayer in and of itself has power because Jesus prayed it. That's the very thing that leads to the meaningless repetition that he actually, Jesus just condemned in verse 7. It's crazy, isn't it? This prayer doesn't have any particular power just because Jesus mentioned it. It's not a rote prayer. It's not intended to be a memorized prayer that we just pray over and over again. Jesus never intended for this prayer to be repeated ritualistically with regular repetitious recital. And yet how many people think that's exactly why it is there? I think it's ironic that the very prayer that Jesus gave us right after he said, do not use meaningless repetition, has become meaningless repetition for those who say this prayer. It's crazy. So Jesus did not pray this prayer for himself. I mean, how many, I mean, good grief. It says there in verse 12, and forgive our debts as we forget ours. How many things did Jesus need to be forgiven of? It's just a misunderstanding. And again, it's not the words in and of themselves that are powerful. You know, prayer, the power of prayer is always in God. It's not in words. In fact, a lot of people in a parallel way of praying this prayer, thinking this prayer is power in the words, come from the 
name it and claim it and blab it and grab it group where they think there's power in the words. If you just say it, man, if you say it, it's yours. Say it, brother. That's none of this. The words in and of themselves contain no spiritual power. They don't transmit spiritual power. Words are a means of communication. The power in prayer is always with God the Father. In fact, this is what the Spirit of God is doing with you and me. The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. We're limited in our scope and understanding. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. This is an amazing resource that every believer in Christ has. The Spirit of God himself is interceding for you and for me according to the will of God. It's amazing. So how should we look at this? Is it an example prayer, a pattern for prayer? Is it a prayer to be repeated? You know, Jesus is addressing, again, wrong methods and wrong motives for prayer. So he says, pray this way. Pray this way. He doesn't say, pray this prayer. He says, pray in this manner. He's talking about a way to pray. Now, the specifics of this prayer apply to those who trust Christ as the Messiah in this, as they were awaiting the kingdom to be set up. The elements of this prayer are appropriate for those of this time period that Jesus was addressing. In fact, if you read a number of versions of this prayer, King James says, after this manner, so the issue is, oh, it's not working. That is a bummer. After this manner, therefore, we pray, our Father which art in heaven. New American Standard says, pray then in this way. He's teaching them how to pray, not what in terms of the specific words to say when you pray. New Living Translation says, pray like this. Phyllis says, pray then like this. Louise says, therefore, as for you, in this manner be praying. Young's literal translation, thus therefore pray ye. And so it's not the words we say, it's it typifies what could be, in terms of the elements of that prayer, should be said to God. And so there's some things we can learn about prayer in this prayer, but there's a lot of things in this prayer that we don't have to pray, specifically. But first it tells us we need to know that our relationship with the one whom we are praying, it's important to focus on him. It's important to focus on him. Your prayer is to be addressed to your heavenly Father. This is how Jesus said this in verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, this was true to the people that were saved in this time period. Those who believed on him. And when it comes to you and me who live in a district dispensation, the God of the universe is our heavenly Father, and we can address him as such. It's true, just like they were to address God as their Heavenly Father, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are to address God as your Heavenly Father as well. And Jesus brought this out during John 15, or John, the high priestly, or the uh, upper room discourse. In John 16, he said, In that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask, notice the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name, ask and you receive that your joy may be full. In John 15, he said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and their fruit should remain, and whatever you ask the Father in my name, that will give to you. And so we're to pray as believers in this dispensation to God as our Heavenly Father. Why that term? The term our Father defines our relationship with God in a very personal way. See, God is not some Wizard of Oz type individual out in the middle of nowhere that you know you have to try to figure out who he is and so forth I mean there's a lot of people that call God creator or almighty or several other names for God but not everyone can call God father that great privilege only belongs to those whom he saved by his grace I'm always encouraged by 1 John 3 1 see what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Amazing. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it does not know him. 
does not know him. If you jump down to verse 10 of that same passage, 1 John chapter 3, it says, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whoever does, whoever does not righteousness is not of God. In other words, every individual, this is a way that divides all mankind, every individual on the planet today is either a child of God or a child of the devil. That sounds awful. How can you say that person is a child of the devil? Well, I didn't say it, but that's what the Bible says. There's two divisions. It's an either-or proposition. You know, Christ said this to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. In other words, they wanted to kill Christ, and guess what? So did the Pharisees. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is zero truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of it. And this is why every individual, according to Romans chapter 3, is born a liar. And we all lie by nature. Ephesians 2 captures it this way, and you were dead. You had no relationship with God because of your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were following the course of this world. You were following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now is at work. In the sons of disobedience, that's a technical term for a child of the devil or an unsaved person. Among whom we all, no one is exempt, once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body of the mind, and we were by nature, another positional term for those that are not saved, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. That's who we were. Everyone born starts out a child of the devil. This is why every individual needs to be born again. You need a spiritual birth. Jesus Christ said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Every individual needs to come to faith in Christ. In fact, Ephesians 2.12 captures it even differently. Prior to salvation, you were without Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers from the covenant of promise. You had zero hope and were without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, it's an either-or proposition. You who were once far away from God have been brought near how? By the blood of Christ. And so verse 12 tells us very clearly we were separated from God in the sense that we were without Christ. We were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise. We had zero hope without God in the world. Every unsaved person, no matter how they function in terms of a relative human righteousness or lack thereof, is dead to God and was without Christ and has no hope. You're in Adam. And in Adam, you're dead to God in trespasses and sins and you're without God in the world. And therefore, you deserve God's wrath manifested for all eternity. You're a child of disobedience. You're a child of wrath. You need to be saved. And this is where God's kindness comes in. Titus 3 says this, When the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, notice, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. God does not accept you on the basis of your spiritual batting average or your efforts to make yourself righteous before him. He saves according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. See, salvation is five things we get from Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's by grace. Grace means you get something you don't deserve. It's a byproduct of the love of God. It's through faith. You need to accept this. And it's a gift from God, which means it's not of you, and it's not of your works. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation from God. It's impossible. <clears throat> a lot of people think that if they're somehow good outweighs their bad, which is ludicrous because their good would never outweigh their bad, that somehow they can make it. I mean, you're not even there. In fact, it only takes one sin to send someone to hell, just like it take one sin in the Garden of Eden for them to be condemned and thrown out of the garden. All the good deeds in the world can't cancel one sin. That's why we needed a Lamb of God. This is why we needed a Savior. See, it was Jesus Christ and his work that canceled all sin at the cross. That was the point of it. God became a man. He lived a perfect life. He knew no sin, and he went to the cross to die for you and for me. And so every individual needs to recognize they can't save themselves because their works don't count. Isaiah 64, 6, we're all like an unclean thing. All our righteousness are like filthy rags. We have nothing to offer God to take away our sin. Salvation, religion, and this is how the Pharisees thought, says, you know what, Jesus Christ, well, they, might even, they didn't even think that. They were 
100% all in on their works, said, they got to do it. Religion today acknowledges Jesus Christ, but you still have to do something. It can't possibly be free. And yet Galatians 2.21 says, I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness came through law keeping, well then Christ died in vain. See, grace means Jesus did it all. He paid the penalty of your sin. He paid the penalty of my sin. On the cross of Calvary, all of your sins were poured out on him. He paid them in full. He rose from the grave. And when you put your trust in him and him alone, you are saved. You become born again. You have everlasting life. You're forgiven of all your trespasses. And it's all by grace. Grace means it's free to you and to me. God saves according to unmerited favor because you are unworthy. And like me, you're have no ability whatsoever to save yourself. You can never, never, never earn it in any way. It's totally free with no strings attached. That's the good news of the gospel. And that message has unfortunately been very muddied in our day. And there's a lot of confusion around that. When you trust Christ as your Savior, you become his child, and he becomes, God becomes your heavenly Father. John 1.12 says, As many as received him to them gave you power to become sons of God. How? Even to those that believe on his name. You can now call the God of the universe your very own Father. That's a precious truth. In fact, you've been adopted into God's family. Notice what Romans 8.15 says. The Spirit you received, as every individual who trusts Christ as Savior gets the Holy Spirit who indwells them, does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Fear is gone now. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. You're like an adult son in the family of God with all kinds of privileges. That's why we cry to him what? Abba, Father. This is mentioned again, Galatians chapter 4. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. God says, you're my prized possession. And because we're his children, God has sent forth the spirit of his son to our hearts, prompting us to call out what? Abba, Father. A relationship now exists, one that did not exist before. Prior to salvation, you could say prayers. Now you can pray. In fact, the next verse says, Where therefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and of a son you're an heir of God through Christ. Do you recognize this preciousness, the preciousness of this truth? That is a gift by God's grace, you are now his child. You entered into a relationship that can never end as nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Does this affect your thinking in any way? You can't be turned away. Those of you who have children, you know how much you love your children. God loves you more. Whoops, that ain't working. There's a verse behind that. And it happens to be Ephesians 3.12 which says we have boldness and confidence and access to God the Father through Jesus Christ or him. Access is a Greek word that means, it's, is the idea, the means of admission into the presence of a person in high position. Do you realize that you can come boldly into the throne of grace, to the very throne room of God? Does that affect your thinking? I mean, sometimes, I think years ago I used this illustration of a cheese head getting able to freely go to Lambeau Field and walk on the turf and then have a meeting with Brett Favre. I mean, there's people that live their life and dreaming of that. <laughs> Who cares? Now, I don't say that because I'm not a cheesehead, but I mean, you've got God as your father. You can enter into his presence and commune with him. He says, you can't give any more of an open invitation than I'm giving you right now. Will you please come and talk with me? Why would the writer of Scripture get so excited about this reality if it wasn't significant? And you might be whole humming and thinking, well, whoopee dang, it's a nice day outside, you know? I mean, if this need, didn't need to be taken advantage of, why would he bother? He doesn't have, you don't have the spirit of fear anymore. You have the spirit of love and confidence and can come boldly to the throne of grace. This is a father who loves you supremely. 
Now, as we think of this prayer, we need to recognize dispensationally that the prayers in the New Testament, as we think of the epistles, are quite different from this. They typically focus on our spiritual realities, and that is to where our focus is to be as God's children. We've been given every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. His prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 is that we would know these things, and they, we'd be filled with the inner strength that God gives us, and that these spiritual realities would truly captivate us and make a difference in our lives. And so this prayer is a little different from that perspective. But there are some things we can glean from this. Because there's some parallels here. It's interesting. As we think of this, verse 9 says, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You know, prayer always focuses on on God. Let's start there. Now this is kind of obvious, but prayer is addressed to your heavenly Father here who is in heaven, who reigns in the universe. He's in heaven directly in the universe, controlling what is happening. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows around he knows what's around the next corner. You and I do not. He's in charge. He sees the end from the beginning. He's got all things covered. He's not short-sighted. See, the focal point of prayer should always be, and this is really what this prayer brings out, the honor and glory of God. I should just like stop there and we should just go over that for a long time. Your prayer should be all about the honor and glory of God. If your prayer is nothing but the gimmies, don't bother. I mean, what did Jesus say here? And this applies to you and me. This is the upper room discourse. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do with it. What? To what end? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Why are you asking it in Christ's name? He's our access to the Father. But the objective is what? That the Father might be glorified in the Son. Everything in this prayer has to do with that context. Every prayer should have as its bottom line objective to see God the Father glorified. That should be basic to our prayer life. We should be seeking His exaltation. And that's why knowing the character of who you're bringing your request to is vital. I mean, this is relatively true in the natural realm. Your freedom or lack of freedom in approaching someone in authority with a request is strongly related to their character and your relationship to them. God is now your heavenly father and he's got perfect character. Typically, you're not going to ask something of someone if you know they're unwilling or unable or have no authority to do it. But we're to pray to our father. And when you know the character of your heavenly father, you can boldly come there because of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Father who is in heaven. He has no limitation. Every earthly father, regardless of his wealth, has limited resources, but there's no limited resources with God the Father. He can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. He's able to care for you. This is why we're told in the book of First Peter to cast all our care upon him because he cares for us. That's our Father who is in heaven, the one that's in charge. He is willing, he is able to do that which is consistent with his love and the will that he has for you and for me. And so that gives us tremendous freedoms to make requests to him. We can come boldly to the throne of grace. But again, the overarching purpose of it all is so what? The Father can be glorified through the Son. Is that how you're thinking this morning? We have tremendous freedom to come, but in fact, we're told in James, we have not because we ask not. I mean, as a father who loves his children, I want them to know that they have the freedom to come to me at any time and talk to me. And I've got more faults than you can shake a stick at. And yet, our Heavenly Father has zero faults. He's perfect in every way. Abba Father, he's your daddy. There's no fear there, none. 
You have no fear in coming to God the Father. He's there to guide, protect, direct, supply needs. The list is endless. You can rest in his care. But your prayers need to be focused on who your God is. And he's saying, in essence, well, I know you have trials. And I've ordained those difficulties in your life for your benefit and my glory. I promise never to test you above what you're able. But I will, with every testing, be faithful to make a way of escape. And it's not a physical escape. It's a spiritual escape. So you can handle it. But I want you to come to me because I've given you perfect access all the time. And so when you come to God the Father, you need to recognize who he is and then come with adoration and reverence. What does Jesus tell his disciples to say here? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. That's adoration and reverence. See, that recognizes that you have the proper posture in prayer because you recognize who God is and he's totally worth, worthy of your praise and gratitude. Hallowed be your name. God's name, which represents him, is to be hallowed. is to be set apart with reverence. You know, there's a lot of people, a lot of believers even, that think of God in casual terms and they regard him as you know, their pal or their good buddy or someone they can hang out with or the man upstairs. All those terms lack reverence. And they reduce the creator of the universe into being like themselves. God's name is to be hallowed. And his name includes all that he is. Psalm 9 and verse 10, Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Do you know the Lord? Do you know his name? He's to be given the highest respect and honor. You should never come to him in some flippant or careless manner because he's the supreme being. You know, if you look at these instances where the human beings on earth were privileged to have a vision of the very throne room of God, they were incredibly humbled. I mean, think about this. This is Isaiah's vision. And when he saw the throne room of God, he says, Above God's throne stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried unto another perpetually, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. I mean, this is what the seraphims are doing in heaven. They're impressed with God, and yet oftentimes believers aren't impressed at all. Should any human do less? than what these seraphims are doing? Do you reverently thank God daily for the mercy he's shown you? But you don't understand my life. My life is a disaster through no fault of my own. You know, you may have been dealt a lousy hand. There's no shortage of lousy hands in life. They're everywhere. But that doesn't mean your Heavenly Father doesn't know. That doesn't mean he doesn't care. It's only of the Lord's mercies, however, we're not consumed. And no one is entitled to a life free of trial. A lot of times, we believe what we see materially and think, you know what, I think I'm entitled to that too, aren't I? Actually, the only thing you're really entitled to is hell. And that's the only thing I'm entitled to. And I'm not in hell today, and neither are you, so it's a good day. And we've got a great future. But you need to recognize that according to Acts 17, 28, it's only by the grace of God you live and move and have your being. And yet, how many people, instead of praying about things, merely complain about things and they never get around to praying about things? They just complain about them. They focus on the negative. It seems 24-7. Instead of looking at good for something and thanking God that it could have been worse, they perpetually focus on the negative, the continual drip. Thankfulness should be expressed at all times, even in the vicissitudes of life, even in the pain of life. God knows there's pain throughout life. There is no escape from pain here. And if you're thinking that we can escape the pain here, you've got to reorient your thinking. It's impossible. Life, generally speaking, people, sucks. And you haven't experienced it. It could be a lot worse. I mean, my wife and I, on the way to the conference and back, listened to the story of Corey Tinboom. I was so depressed. 
And yet it had a very happy ending. God delivered her. But you know what? She wasn't shaking her fist in God in a black, dark cell saying, God, how could you allow this to happen? Instead, she's praying for her captors that they would see the love of Christ and get saved. Where we're thinking, God, how can you let me, you know, have this illness? My knee doesn't work. Wow. You got it tough. And I'm not trying to downplay anything here. But what are we entitled to? Are you thanking God and saying, Lord, you are so holy in mercy, I don't deserve to be alive today, but you have given me all things to pertain to life and godliness. Do you think like that? Why did Peter tell this to the suffering saints, which we know nothing of? Wherefore, let them suffer according to the will of God. And God's got suffering for everybody. In the will of God, what are we to do? Pray that God gets us out of the jam? It's not what it says here. It says commit the keeping of their souls, the real you, to him and well-doing. Because you could get your head lopped off for Jesus Christ. This is why we're in, to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Either Jesus does all things well or he doesn't. And again, God the Father knows everything that you're going through. He does, he cares immensely. But he said, this is how it is. But my grace will be sufficient for you. To not give thanks is never acceptable when praying. You're not a, an independent creature that's sovereign over your own life. God could snuff you and me out in a millisecond. But the fact that we have a heavenly Father we can come to at any time who loves us supremely and promise that his grace would be sufficient means that I should come with absolute reverence 100% of the time. He promised never to leave me or forsake me. He's always there. You know, one of the reasons your prayer life might be as flat as a pancake is you're not focusing on who your God is. You're not thankful for how he has ministered to you and what he's given you. I mean, obviously, he allows things in our lives that we would prefer not to happen, but he still does all things well. But when you pray the promises of God and the, based on the character of God, and that's in the forefront of your thinking, there's going to be a bounce in those prayers. Because you recognize it's not about you, it's about him. Hallowed be thy name. Is that how you're thinking this morning? Lord, thank God I can be here today to hear the word of God, which can deliver my soul. Do you know the promises of God? So that when you come to God the Father as your daddy, that you can just thank him and pray those promises and allow them to minister to you? And you're thanking him even though you want something to be different because when the dust settles and the smoke clears, I want Jesus Christ to have the preeminence. Not, God, make my life comfortable, please. Is it about you or is it about the Lord? Jesus said, you say, you pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Your prayer should desire God's will to be done. Does that characterize your prayers? You know, right before Christ went to be crucified, as he's sweating drops of blood, he says, not my will be done, your will be done. Because he knew it wasn't a picnic. This is what God wants. Now, we don't pray in our day and age, and I was counting on using this, but I can't, for the kingdom to come. The kingdom will come. Jesus Christ is ministering right here as we think of this broad timeline here. He came here to set the kingdom. He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so you, living in that time, you prayed that this kingdom come. Well, they rejected him. And so he went to the cross. He was resurrected. And then 40 days later, the church began. And this is where we are. And this is what we're looking forward to. And then after the tribulation, that kingdom that they prayed for will be set up. See, today our prayer is to be different. In fact, the last prayer in the Bible is what? 
He who testifies these things says, surely I'm coming quickly. Even so, come Lord Jesus. We're praying for the rapture. We're not praying for the kingdom. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Now would be a great time. Thank you. See, this prayer acknowledges God's agenda, God's will, God's plan. And so should our prayers. Because again, it's about God receiving the glory due his name. And he does all things well. When you pray, you should have in mind the blessed hope. Paul said this to Titus, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us the denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly and righteously in God in this present age. That's how we should be thinking. Why? Verse 13. Because we're looking for that blessed hope. Our necks stretched out. And that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. I mean, how does that compare with the prayer that says, God, if you could just send me the correct Powerball numbers and I could have an easy life, that would be just swell. You know, instead of saying, Lord, give me a comfortable life, why don't you say, you know what, Lord, give me the grace to understand how... I can rise above and honor you in the uncomfortableness of my life. Not my will be done, thy will be done. Does that characterize your prayer? Or is it, Lord, I've got the gimmies here, and if you could just, you know, help me out here, thanks. It's not that God doesn't care. He gives us all things rich to do enjoy, but what's your objective here? You want to pray the will of God. Because isn't this the bottom line? Whether you eat, drink, whatever you do, it's all to the glory of God. Is that how you're thinking here today? Do you really want to do the will of God? Is it reflected in your prayers? Are you orienting your thinking toward the word of God so it communicates you know what you're praying for? Is the will of God is communicated through the word of God? And that includes bringing all your personal requests to him. But he also mentions physical needs. Nothing wrong with praying for physical needs. Give us our, this day our daily bread, verse 11. That's an expression that you recognize that God is the supplier of everything you need. He gives us the food that sustains our daily life. You're acknowledging him that that's what he does. You know, we live in America where we're so abundant. We have so much abundance. I mean, how many of us really do this? Pray about our supply of food and clothing and shelter and all the physical necessities of life. Since we live in abundance, rarely do we take time to ask for these things. But do you thank him for? But I say grace before every meal. Yeah, yeah, well, that's good. But so many times people say grace before every meal, and it's just a mechanical thing that's kind of a sanctimonious say, well, hey, let's eat. Let's get this prayer out of the way so we can dig in. And we forget every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turn. He's the source of all we need, and so we should acknowledge him when we pray. Because nothing we eat or wear or have did not come from this earth. And God is sustaining the earth, and he's providing it through the things that he created. And it's obviously it's not going to be always what you want, but it's certainly going to be always what you need, because he knows your need better than you do. He knows what to give you, even though you think it should be something else. Now, he just said in verse 7 or 8 that he knows everything before him asks, so why do we even ask? Some people get irritated that the unbeliever never thanks God for anything, and yet he's got more than I do. You know, prayer isn't really something where we inform God of our needs, because he knows those things. Prayer is designed to influence us. We're the ones that need a prayer, not God. He knows what we need of. God doesn't need to be told, but we need to tell him. That's the point. 
you're, when you say, God, give us this day our daily bread, or when they were to say that, it was acknowledging their, their trust was in God who was the supplier of all our physical needs. And we're to work hard as unto the Lord, as in many cases the Lord's way of meeting our needs is through physical labor. What about relational needs? Verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive debtors. Now, dispensationally, we don't have to pray this prayer at all. Like verse 11 says, forgive us our sins and we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. That's the concept here. What the point he's making is in part of your prayer life, you need to consider the relationships in your life and how you in particular are functioning relative to those who God has placed in your life. And when it comes to your own walk with the Lord, there's a need of confession on a daily basis so your relationship with God isn't hindered. But we don't have to ask the Father. We are simply to acknowledge in humility that we have sinned and he is faithful to give us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the beauty about being in Christ. When you're in Christ, you're in the family of God. That's a subtle issue. God wants you to enjoy fellowship with him. And so when we sin, we break fellowship with God, we confess that sin, we're brought into fellowship with God. But he's saying, because you have been forgiven, I want you to pray about your relationship with other people and forgive those that may have offended you. You know, if you're unwilling to forgive someone else for their small transgression, how can you expect God to forgive your own? See, that demonstrates you really don't understand or you're not resting in the fact that God has forgiven you for infinitely more that's worse. In fact, this is an issue he makes here in verse 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, then your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men your trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is in the context of a family relationship. Now, we don't earn God's forgiveness by forgiving others, but we demonstrate our understanding of the grace and forgiveness he's shown us as we apply the same thing to others for the glory of God. And this is commanded in several places in the New Testament. You know, if you look back, remember Jesus said this? It's the first thing he said in Matthew 5 when showing verse 23. In the context of worshiping God, therefore if you bring your gift to the altar and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar. In other words, I want your worship, but Let's get this fixed so you can worship me properly. Go your way, first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, then you'll be thrown into prison. You know, our relationships with one another are so important to God. He says, don't even think that you're honoring me with worship if you're harboring some bitterness or some unforgiveness in your heart towards someone else. It doesn't work that way. That's why, again, Isaiah 6, or Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord doesn't hear me. You're not to be praying, Lord, punish that other believer for what they've done to me. You know, Lord, I pray that they die. No, you're to love your enemies, right? Didn't Jesus say that here in chapter 5? Verse 44, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. You're to be a reflection of the grace that God has shown you to your brothers. You ever pray that, you know, we brought this up at family camp, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but on loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only at his own interests, but also at the interests of others. Do you pray for others? Others that bug you? Husbands, are you praying for your wife? Wife, are you praying for your husbands? As you pray for these things, the Spirit of God works in you to change you. God wants relational harmony with himself as his father and with the relationships that he's put in your life. What else? Your prayers should mention spiritual needs. 
What do you say in verse 13? And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is about God's spiritual protection. And this needs some clarification. Again, this is the prayer that was appropriate in this dispensation. We don't have to necessarily pray this prayer. I mean, James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted from, by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. And so it says, don't lead us into temptation. I think this, I think, Chrysostom captured this. Particular petition is the most natural appeal of human weakness as it faces danger. I think that might be what Christ is communicating here. But you know, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ today, you simply need to walk in the deliverance that has been provided to you. Right in the same context, right after he talks about testings and then temptations, he says, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to what? Deliver your soul. This is a prayer for deliverance. Deliverance from the evil one. The word of God and the resources you have in Christ are sufficient for you to be delivered from every evil that you might face. That's part of the riches we have in Christ. We can be thankful today that we got the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God, and 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he who that is in you than he that is in the world. You can take full advantage of the reality that you have received all things to pertain to life and godliness. And so we're to be thankful for these resources and appropriate them by faith and walk in newness of life because of our position in Christ. So we don't have to pray this. But you know when some... When temptation suddenly appears or when someone makes your blood boil or you need wisdom in a decision or you're perplexed in a multitude of thoughts, you can pray. You can pray. That's the resources that we have in Christ and this is in some ways what he's alluding to here. You know, I'm so encouraged by this promise right here. Your Savior's interceding for you right now. Therefore, he's able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Do you realize your Savior's interceding for you? That's how much he loves you? That he's your advocate with the Father when you fail miserably? That he goes to bat for you? When Satan goes before God and he, he's called the accuser of the brethren, Jesus Christ is there saying, no, he belongs to me. I'm interceding for him. He's your high priest who's your perfect empathizer and sympathizer and knows all that touches you intimately. And again, implores you to come boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Amazing, isn't it? And your prayer should mention praise and thanksgiving. How does this prayer wrapped up? Second half of verse 13, but deliver. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The prayer begins and ends with God getting the glory. Do you thank him in advance for listening to you and hearing your prayers? Do you thank God for this promise right here? 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. Do you thank him in advance? Do you let him know that he is worthy to receive power and glory forever and ever? So it comes down again to, in your prayer life, whose glory are you seeking? Whose praise are you seeking? Who are you serving? Do you want God to serve you and that's why you pray or do you want to serve him and you count it a privilege to just come boldly and humbly before him to thank him? You know, Pastor Rich McCarroll, who I think is coming again to the Fall Bible Conference, he's been there several times, he hasn't been there in a while, but he told a story that's actually in one of the daily breads. He explained to his young son how his secretary screened phone calls at the church and said, if your mom calls me and I'm busy, 
the church secretary will tell her what I'm doing, and then mom will decide if I should be interrupted or she should leave a message. But he said to his son, if you call me, you'll be put right through. I want you to know that you can call me anytime because you're my son. A few days later, the church secretary put a call through to the pastor from his son. He said hello and asked what he could do for his son. He replied, nothing, Dad. I just wanted to make sure I could actually get through to you that easily. <laughs> you think his son was encouraged? That as busy as his father was, he would stop and take his call? Do you have a heavenly father that is very busy, and yet he's not too busy for you? We have instant access to the Father. There's no secretary to screen his calls. There's no decision that needs to be made. Well, I don't know if I'm going to let you bother me right now. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. Do you realize much how much your Father loves you? Jesus has provided a way for you to go into the very throne room of God, and his ears are open to your cry. And he cares more than you can even wrap your brain around. And so come boldly. But then recognize who he is. Recognize what the goal is. The goal is not to say, God, you're my genie. Come through for me. I got my finger stuck in a pencil sharpener. God, please get it out. It should be, Lord, if my finger in this pencil sharpener can bring honor and glory to you, then keep it there. You know, Rich McCarroll wanted to know his son that the access was true and it was available and it really worked. And it's like God the Father is bending over backwards saying, I've adopted you as my son. This prayer really works. Will you please do it? And we're told to pray without ceasing. We're to focus on our Father, to thank him for all that he's done, all he's doing and all that he will do. We have so many resources at our disposal. Are we taking advantage of them? And so what's your mindset when it comes to prayer? Is it, thank you, Lord, for being my heavenly Father. Hallowed be your name. Thank you that I can cast my burdens upon you. I want your will done in my life more than anything else in the world, and I'm going to give you the glory in everything you do. If you pray like that, the impact of your prayers is immeasurable. Immeasurable. He knows all the things that are going to touch our lives. And he promised his grace will be sufficient and we can come to him through wisdom and we grow through the trials, but he'll never test us above our able. You need to see who your father is and come boldly, even though life is painful and difficult and it doesn't work out the way you want. That's how it is. You know, pray for Doug Patterson. You know, the guy lost his wife of cancer about a year ago. His daughter's going through it. His mind's spent 100 miles an hour. He knows God is good, but all around his life is pain, difficulty, heartache. And I gave him this verse yesterday. And I gave him another verse, and I said, you know what? God knows, and he's got a plan, and we don't get it. But he does all things well. I mean... What else can you say? Life sucks in many, many ways, and yet life is good in many, many ways, and we can give thanks to God, and he does all things well, and when it's all over, it's going to be so good forever. So let's make hay. Let's put some hay in the barn. Let's give our Father the glory to his name especially when we pray. Father, we're humbled again as we consider who you are and who puny, how puny we are, and yet you love us and you demonstrated that love so wonderfully and perfectly at the cross of Calvary. Thank you for our Savior. Thank you that he's with us here. He lives inside us. He wants us to point us to you, the one who does all things well. Help us to have a humble posture and recognize that our times are in your hands and that our life is merely a vapor and we can buy up out of time the opportunities you give us 
as we consider you, consider who we are in Christ, consider your riches, consider your will. May the heart's desire of each one here today be to do your will, to see you honored and glorified. And may we always have thankful and humble hearts, for you are so worthy. Pray and give thanks in Jesus' name.